This is Danny Shapiro, host of Family Secrets. Welcome to our fourth season. Family Secrets. It seems just about every family has them. Some secrets are kind of small and insignificant, and some are shocking and massive. When they come out, our new knowledge has the power to change our lives. Join me and our millions of listeners as we dive deep into the stories of this new season's amazing guests. Listen and subscribe on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Hey, welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind. My name is Robert Lamb. And I'm Joe McCormick, and it's Saturday. Time for a Vault episode. Uh, This episode originally aired on October 8th, 2019, and it was about how cars affect our bodies and our minds. Yeah, this was this was a fun episode to put together. I think there, this was actually one that came out in October. Uh, it was a, a sponsored affair, but we were like, all right, if we have to do a, an episode about cars during the month of October, we're going to get a little uh, Christine talk in there. We're going to talk <laughs> about uh, um, Stephen King and John Carpenter a bit. And, I, and I, I believe we shoehorned that into the very beginning. But then the rest of the episode, I think, is a lot of fun because it gets into like what happens to us. Who do we become when we merge with the automobile? Vroom, vroom. Welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hey, welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Mind. My name is Robert Lamb. And I'm Joe McCormick. And hey, it's still October. That's right. Uh, You know, this episode, we need to go ahead and uh, stay at the front. Uh, This episode is sponsored by Lexus. Mm -hmm. Lexus asked us... They make cars. They make cars. They asked us to do an episode that uh, revolves around uh, automobiles and deals with automobiles. And we said, sure. But also, since it is October, since it is our our month of Halloween celebration, we have to kick things off by discussing something, uh, uh, at least a little halloween We're going to have to talk about Stephen King's Christine. Right. It got your brain winding on those Cars Without Driver movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of you may best remember Christine from, from the book. Uh, uh-huh. I, I remember reading the book back in, I think, junior high. And then, then, of course, there's John Carpenter's 1983 film adaptation. This is one of the only classic Carpenter-era films I have not seen. Yeah. It's been a while, it's been a while since I've seen it, but it's a it's a pretty pretty great concept. Uh, the, the film, as the book, uh, concerns a murderous red and white 1958 Plymouth Fury, and the vehicle is possessed by a by a malicious will and a jealousy uh, with which it protects the character Arnie Cunningham. So this is like uh, I've heard it described before. It's basically like there's this teen boy. He gets this car. The car is sort of possessed, and it becomes like a murderous jealous lover. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the, the shorthand for it. But I also think that, that King and Carpenter, at least on some level, you know, they're, they're playing with a few other elements. They're playing certainly with nostalgia mm-hmm. uh, because it's a very nostalgic uh, vehicle that ends up uh, possessing uh, the kid. You know, there's certainly I, – I mean, certainly when I think back on it, I think on, on the fact that it seems to deal a lot with like really – toxic ideas of masculinity and, you know, it's just filled with awful men mm. in their cars uh-huh. and their vehicles. But uh, but also this idea that a car could change us mm. or that a car becomes the um, uh, the means by which we, we chase change. Mm-hmm. Uh, because at the center of it, there is this character that undergoes a transformation uh, through his use of the automobile. And of course, it's, it's Stephen King, it's John Carpenter. So it ends up, it has this supernatural flair to it. Uh, But I think at heart, one of the reasons that that people dig the story is like, they get this idea of the, the the car as being something that can have an effect on human behavior and human identity and uh, and can be something we chase after for those reasons. Yeah, and that goes multiple ways. So there's the one hand where we're chasing it where it's like new car, new me. You know, mm-hmm. people want to sort of like uh, maybe upgrade or change their personal image or change their view of themselves by getting a new car. Uh, and then there's the way, of course, that m- maybe in a more uh, unconscious and sub Mediterranean way, just driving changes the way we interact with the world. Yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, there's also the personification aspect of it. You know, yeah. Christine uh, is the car, it, she, however you want to identify it. We end up personifying it in the show. And this is a trend that can, that is used elsewhere in storytelling. It was used in a, a 1944 story uh, named Killdozer that was later made into <laughs> a, a film, I believe. You have uh, what the, the love bug. Uh, and then 
then later on, you had uh, the likes of Mega Weapon from Warrior of the Lost World. So good. Uh, there's the Green Goblin tractor trailer rig and King's own 1986 uh, self-directed adaptation of his 1978 short story, Trucks, uh, the legendary Maximum Overdrive. Woo, that one's a mess. Yeah. <laughs> but, but but already, I think we get, a, just by looking at our fiction about vehicles, we get this idea that our relationship with them is kind of complicated. Yeah. Like, they are these things that we kind of see as non-human entities, mm-hmm. and yet uh, and, and yet we personify them. And then we also merge with them, and we allow them to, to change how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive others. Uh, cars are very much one of, one of the early steps towards cyborgism. Yeah. I mean, we totally incorporate the car into the sense of self. And I think that there's really interesting evidence for that, too, from psychological research. Yeah. Uh, but— like the horse-drawn carriage yes. is essentially a relationship between uh, human and horse mm-hmm. with the carriage as a, 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 you can see it, I guess, as a facilitator or just this necessary prop. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the horseless carriage is all about uh, the human and the machine. Yeah, I don't know if I can think of another technology that fills both of these roles quite the way that that cars do, that are both uh, sort of a a slightly personified external entity, like the way that, you know, people interact with robots as if they're living creatures. People sort of interact with cars as if they're living creatures, but then also incorporated into the self, like the car as an extension of the brain and the body. Yeah. Like I I feel like to a certain extent, we see some of these things happening with people who own and operate boats, especially Mm -hmm. smaller boats. Uh, because certainly boats can be, uh, you know, used as a symbol. They can, you know, et cetera. They can, you know, fall falls in a number of these categories. But at the same time, a boat doesn't. It tends not to enclo- enclose one the way an automobile is. Mm-hmm. And of course, the automobile, especially in the United States, is this thing that is. Uh, and it's almost expected of everyone <laughs> uh, that, would have, that you should have access to it. Where of course a boat is going to be more of a, uh, a thing in coastal regions or areas with access to to mm-hmm. larger bodies of water. Maybe if people regularly drove submarines. Yeah. (laughs) Submersibles. Little personal submersibles. Yeah, I'm trying to think of other technologies we have such an intimate relationship with as we Mm -hmm. do with uh, our cars. If you're a car owner and you drive regularly. I mean, you would have your uh, electronic devices like your computer or your smartphone. But I don't really see those being personified, really. They they become more just sort of a a medium space like through which you enter that cyber world. You don't have a name for your phone? No. Oh, Oh, no. Oh, yes. I call it Satan. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) but do you have a name? for your car. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Wait, do you have a name for your phone? No, but I call my wife's phone phony. So if, <laughs> if, if the phone if can't, the phone cannot be found, we'll, we'll, I'll be like, well, where's phony? Let's find phony. Um, <laughs> but my car does not have a, have a name. I, the, the one I had in high school did have a name. It was... Uh, it was a, what a Christine? Green, no, no, it was a, it was a green Chevy Malibu, uh, and uh, it was its name was the Green Machine. That was just what it had always been called before it, uh, I became the owner of it. So, is it named after a Kaya song? Uh, no, the, I later when I discovered that Kaya song, uh, which is a cool <laughs> cool track, I, I was reminded of my time with the Green Machine, uh, the vehicle. But uh, no, there, I don't think there was any direct relationship there. But we'll get back to this idea of you know naming your car and our, our association with cars uh, in, in terms of personification in a bit. Uh, but first, let's I said I think we should probably turn our minds to just the uh, the most obvious relationship, the relationship between the car and the human brain. Sure. Now, one line of research here shouldn't really be a surprise at all. I think it is that uh, research indicates that our state of mind affects how we drive. Kind of duh, right? Yeah. I mean, that's obvious. And one, the most obvious way, I think, is the thing we've all had drilled into us by this point, yet some people still do not pay attention to, which is that there are multiple states of mind you can get into in which you should not drive at all. Right. You know, driving drunk, driving fatigued, driving distracted, uh, don't do these things. They kill people, okay? And even if you think that you're at normal, you know, uh, driving ability, like we're not very good at judging our own ability to drive at any given time. Right. Uh, so that's the more obvious one. One that's still probably kind of obvious but less obvious maybe is that emotional states uh, affect how we drive. Uh, I was looking at one study from the journal Accident Analysis and Prevention from 2014 by Reutel et al. called Emotional States of Drivers and the Impact on Speed, Acceleration, and Traffic Violations, a simulator study. And basically they measured performance responses in a driver 
driving simulation to different scenarios that were designed to get you to feel certain emotions like anxiety, fear, anger, and contempt. Uh, And the results were the following. Anger is bad. You don't want to be angry while you drive. They say, quote, results indicate that anger leads to stronger acceleration and higher speeds, even for two kilometers beyond the emotion eliciting event. So something makes you mad. You don't just zoom past it and then go back to baseline. You zoom past it and you kind of stay in a heightened state of angry speeding around for a while. Mm. Uh, The authors found that both anxiety and contempt create similar effects to anger, but the effects were somewhat weaker, uh, so still stronger acceleration, higher speeds. Uh, They found that fright was the only uh, emotion that actually improved driving performance by some measures. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they said that fright, quote, correlated with stronger braking momentum and lower speeds directly after the critical event. So I think the obvious solution is to go in the Christine direction. Like you need to get your car haunted. You take it to the neighborhood (laughs) witch, get it jammed with curses and screaming ghosts, and then you'll be a safer driver. Interesting. Uh, I mean, it's certainly there's there's plenty of media and there's plenty in, in news coverage, uh, you know, of the the dangers of driving. Mm-hmm. But it does make you wonder if like there's such a, if there is a, a strong connection between fear and driving safer. There needs to be stuff like on the dashboard <laughs> that that in, inspires fear. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yeah. So I, I'm kidding about that. Obviously, <laughs> I, I don't. The, now there might be measures by which driving afraid it makes you actually worse at driving. It was just on the measures that they looked mm-hmm. at in this study. So like when people were scared. Scared, they lowered their speed, of course, and lower speeds correlate to fewer accidents and that kind of thing. Right. So good on that measure, but not necessarily good to be afraid while driving on every measure. We don't know what all those measures would be. Uh, but so while the specific details there might be instructive, we also all know that that mind states we bring to the road affect how we operate a vehicle. On the other hand, I think it's really interesting to think about the psychology of driving in the opposite direction, not how the mind state we bring to the car affects how we drive, but how driving affects our minds overall. Yeah. Uh, one of the big things that that, uh, that really struck me in looking at all this was just how how cognitively demanding driving really is, mm-hmm. even though it's something that you know, so many, especially if you've been doing it for a while, right. if, you're, if you're learning to drive, it can, it can feel rightfully overwhelming. Like I remember that feeling and, and thinking like, how am I going to do this? And you know, the, the, the adults in my lives were saying things like, oh, well, everybody does it. It can't be that hard. You'll get it. You know, everybody drives. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but it is a cognitively demanding task. Uh, I was looking at a uh, a paper titled Mind Over Machine, and uh, in it, uh, Hubert Dreyfus et al. describe learning to drive a car as something that is, quote, so designed that almost all novices can eventually reach the level we call expert, hmm. which, I, which I think is interesting. So we're dealing with something that, again, is, is a cognitively demanding um, activity, and yet we have it refined in such a way, and maybe the task itself lends itself in such a way that most humans who undertake it can reach a very high level of mastery. Now, certainly there are going to still be plenty of people who are better than you at driving. Right. There are probably going to be people that are at worse. But on average, we have this we have this world in which we have wrapped it in highways and roads and we give and people have these vehicles that are in just inherently dangerous by being, you know, fast moving pieces of, of steel and glass and, mm-hmm. and so forth. And for the most part, it goes pretty well. Well, uh-huh. uh, yeah, it's kind of amazing how much it goes well. I mean, this goes against obviously our, our normal framing and negativity bias and stuff when we think about traffic, which is you get out on the road and you think, oh, everybody out there is just the worst at driving. It's mm-hmm. just awful. But no, I mean, it, on one hand, that can be true. But at the same time, you could just say it's amazing how well it mostly goes. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, which, again, can be hard to, hard to stomach if you're stuck in traffic or if there's a particularly crazy you know, driver weaving in and out of, of traffic. But, uh, but, uh, but still, it's worth stopping to, to realize. But a lot of this, I think, gets down to the fact that, that we are highly evolved tool users. And uh, the automobile vehicle is essentially a complex tool. When we use, say, a hammer, we extend our body schema through it. Our brain updates its notion of where our body ends and the world begins. It incorporates the hammer into our conception of the body, and we then wield it as an extension of ourself to uh, you know a large extent. And a, a car also 
uh, affects this, you know, like we become the car and it changes our perception then of the, the world beyond us. Yeah. And this is something really interesting to consider. Now, I've talked on the show before uh, without any specific evidence. I, I remember just talking about a general intuition that our perception of space and relationship to other objects seems different when we're in a car versus when we're just walking around on the street. We actually found a study this time that talks directly about this phenomenon. Uh, so this, uh, this study here is by Moeller et al. It's called What a Car Does to Your Perception. Distance Evaluations Differ from Within and Outside of a Car from the Psychonomic Bulletin and Review 2016. And so the authors start off here by talking about how research already exists to show that the use of uh, like handheld tools, you use the idea of a hammer, maybe an axe uh, or like a like a grabber claw, you know, mm -hmm. those uh, those funneled things to get something down off top of the refrigerator, that they extend our perception of near space. They sort of alter our view of how near and far away things are within their when they're within like rough reach of this tool. And other research suggests that our ideas of near and far are frequently altered by our potential to act within a given space. So like whether you're currently using a tool that allows you to quickly access some kind of activity or change something within a certain space, it changes your view of how close or far that space is from you. Now on the issue of, of vehicle versus tool, the vehicle as a tool, uh, the authors also point out, quote, one marked difference between handheld tools and vehicles is that the latter are mainly used for transportation and not to manipulate the environment. Nevertheless, for a long time, authors have repeatedly suggested that vehicles might be defined as tools as well. However, they do note that there has been less research, however, on vehicle tools and human cognition. Yeah, and so what this study set out to do was just see how sitting in a vehicle or having recently used a vehicle changes your perception of space according to these uh, guidelines. So basically what they did is they had people sit at a, a starting line, you know, like you stand behind the line and you mm -hmm. judge various distances out in front of you between like four and 20 meters. And they would vary the conditions, whether you'd be a pedestrian just sitting there uh, in a chair or on foot or sitting in a car or sitting in a kind of car simulation later that was basically not a car, but it was like a, a black wooden frame that would block out the same parts of your view that would normally be obscured if you were sitting in a car, mm -hmm. right? So that's a good control condition, right? It, it sort of uh, it counteracts the idea that your perception would be altered just by what the car normally blocks you from seeing. Yeah, they end up concluding that cars, quote, modulate the perception of far distances because they modulate the driver's perception like a tool typically does and change the perceived action potential. And, you know, I can I can I think I can relate to this in in my day to day life. Uh, if I if I have driven the car to, say, a, um, a large shopping complex uh -huh. uh, where you have a large parking area and then stores around the edges of that parking area. And so let's say the grocery store is on one side. Right. And the bookstore is on the far other side. Uh -huh. And I have to pick something up from both the bookstore and the grocery store. I may drive to the grocery store uh, to do my main shopping and then I'll in while I'm driving, I'll think in my mind, well, okay, I'll get out, I'll do the grocery store run, and then I'll just walk over to the bookstore and then back to the back to the car. Right. And that makes perfect sense. But then I get out of the car, I may I go inside, I walk around, I do the grocery shopping, I'm bringing the, the, the food back to my vehicle, and then I realize this is a big parking lot. Uh -huh. Maybe this, this, this is actually maybe a walk I, I'm not willing to take. I'm going to get back in the car, and I'm going to drive across the parking lot <laughs> to the bookstore. Uh -huh. And I think that that could possibly... You could make the argument that that kind of decision making is based in the fact that when I'm in the car, it, it really doesn't seem like that big of a distance. But when I'm out of the car, I can more accurately judge the distance across the parking lot. Well, this is not covered in the study we looked at or in any study that I could find. But it also makes me wonder about not just estimations of distances, mm -hmm. but judgments about the traversability of spaces. Right. Um, so does being in a car make you see a particular landscape as more or less traversable? 
traversable in general, not just distance, but like, you know, there, there are certain parking lots that you could drive across, but you don't really like want to walk across them if they're like, you know, big lanes going across the middle of them where there are a lot of cars moving or something. Oh, right. I mean, it could also affect, uh, you know, how you perceive, say, the walkability of your neighborhood. Yes. Or what kind of a walking commute you might have to the nearest train or bus station, that sort of thing. Yeah, totally. Uh, now, a couple of other things from the discussion section of this paper. Uh, so one thing they say is that specifically, like, how much did drivers underestimate distances when compared to pedestrians. They say, quote, drivers underestimated even the shortest distance, which I think would have been four meters, by approximately 40 percent. And this underestimation did not increase any more for increasing distances. So that's kind of interesting. It's like their rough underestimation percentage stayed about the same as the distances got farther, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we want to say again, this was not due to drivers having part of their vision blocked by the body of the car which is a thing uh, because they compared it to pedestrians just sitting there with like a black frame blocking the same parts of their vision and there was still a difference. It was the idea that I'm in a car. It was what seemed to be acting on people to make this misjudgment of distance. But another variation they looked at was did movement before the experiment alter anything? Uh, they found that if you walk for 10 minutes before you make the judgment of distance, this did not influence distance ex uh, estimation. So walking around doesn't change anything. Mm -hmm. But if you drive the car for 10 minutes, this led to even larger underestimations of dis distances. Uh, so they conclude in the end, quote, the moment you sit in your car, your distance perception of the environment seems to adapt to your new action potential. Again, underlining how strongly related action and perception representations in the cognitive system are. And th this makes me just want to see more research along these lines about the ways our perception of n not just space, but also again, like a uh, objects in the landscape and stuff mm -hmm. are altered by being inside a car. Like here's an example. How much different would you estimate uh, the mass of an object in front of you if you're in a car versus not in a car? I wonder if being in a car makes other things around you look uh, smaller and less significant and less weighty. Perhaps. I don't know. But I mean, I ask that because, I mean, I wonder if like being in a car also sort of upgrades your body schema to think more like, I am not a, a small primate, I am a rhinoceros. Yeah, I mean, there is, I feel like there is this sense of, um, yeah, of, of power that, that comes into play when you're in the vehicle. I mean, the vehicle is a, is a powerful uh, object uh, that can travel at, at greater speeds uh, than, than a human can uh, travel otherwise. And you're also cut off from your environment to a certain extent. I mean, yeah, there's really nothing between you and the, the surrounding uh, world uh, besides, uh, you know, some steel and some glass and you know, a, a, a you know, locking mechanism, but but still, uh, you, it's easy to be in a vehicle and feel uh, very much uh, detached yeah. from, say, uh, the neighborhood you're driving through, mm -hmm. or the uh, or or you know the the events on the the side of the road that you're driving past. Yeah, um, it, it, I think it does contribute to this sense of detachment. Yeah, I sometimes feel this way. Now, on one hand, I do enjoy uh, driving through like beautiful landscapes that I, you mm -hmm. know, uh, it's, it's a thing I like. I like, you know, driving in the mountains or something. But also there is a kind of sense where looking through the windshield of a car moving through an environment is almost kind of like a, an upgraded form of watching a movie yeah. of the environment. And I notice, you know, when I get to a really beautiful place, if there is an ability, I do want to stop the car and get out just to look, even just to look at some Something that I could see through the windows of the car. Why do I want to get out of the car? I want to manipulate my experience somehow by removing myself from the movie screen. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm, I think we can also all relate to the things that we don't see when we drive. Yeah. Um, the main example that comes to mind of this is if there's a if I typically drive a certain way and then uh, and then I return on that same route but I'm in the passenger seat instead. Oh yeah. And then I'll I'll see something like oh I've driven I've driven by this house so many times I never see that house I guess because I'm more concerned with uh, you know the turn I'm about to make etc. But uh, but that can that can be rather illuminating as well to to realize oh that I've, I've just never really seen this one particular uh, landmark uh, in my 
my driving. Like my my perception is not as uh, you know as all encompassing as I might think. I'm not I'm not seeing out of all of these windshields at once. That's a really good point. Some of the movie screen effect, I guess, would be not just from being in the car, but specifically from being the driver of the car. All right. On that note, we're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, we will personify our cars a little bit. All right, we're back. All right, so you had a car when, you, what, you were in high school, you said? High school, yeah. Yeah, high school named The Green Machine. Yeah. Was it in any way inspired by The Green Goblin from Maximum Overdrive? No, uh, I imagine I'd seen Maximum Overdrive by that point, but uh, no, <laughs> it didn't really have anything to do with that. Uh, but yes, we will come back to The Green Goblin here in a minute. Uh, when we when we look at our cars, though, we we uh, sometimes do personify them. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think I do this a lot consciously. Like, I don't name cars. Some mm-hmm. people do. But when you look at a car, you still may anthropomorphize it to some extent, even if it's not like an overt thing in your mind. I would say there are two main reasons for this. One is that it moves, and any technology that moves mm-hmm. is especially prone to being anthropomorphized. The other is that it has headlights, and headlights are oriented like eyes. Right. And, and then it has a grill, which looks like yeah. a mouth. Yeah. So it, it, it And I'm not just joking about that. I think the headlights make a big difference. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, we tend to anthropomorphize things anyway. You know, it's it's difficult to not think of something as a certain type of entity if we draw a smiley face on it, right? Just right. a really abstract face. And the car in its typical uh, design has this abstract face built into it. And uh, and, and there uh, have been studies that look at this. Uh, I was looking at, is this car looking at you? <laughs> How anthropomorphism predicts fusiform face area activation when seeing cars uh, by Kuhn, Brick, Muller, and uh, uh, Galanot. And this is from PLOS 1 uh, 2014. And they observe the tendency in subjects to activate their fusiform face area, the FFA, uh, while looking at car fronts. Yeah, and the FFA is a, a part of the brain that is commonly activated, of course, when you are recognizing other human faces. Right. And so they, they state, quote, the results point to an important role of FFA in the phenomenon of ascribing human attributes to non-living objects. Interestingly, brain regions that have been associated with thinking about beliefs and mental states of others, uh, the, the TPA, TPJ, the uh, MPFC, uh, do not seem to be related to anthropomorphism of car fronts. So I would assume to activate these other regions, we need something more overt, perhaps, like we'd need that green goblin face from the front of the semi-truck in maximum overdrive. Uh Um, But I wonder to what extent these factors, this this factors into some of our tendencies to assume the worst of other cars. Because if we're anthropomorphizing the vehicle, but we're not doing so to the extent that we're, we're thinking about the the car's beliefs or its mind state, you know, uh-huh. we're kind of seeing it as this mindless animal. Uh-huh. And so it, it would make sense then that we assume the worst of it. Like, what is this car beast doing cutting me off? What is this other car beast doing uh, with its brights on? You know, because because we we're not thinking ab- about the, uh, you know, the, the, the actual emotional state of the Volkswagen bug. Well, this leads me to another question that I don't think uh, I didn't find any research about this, but it makes me think, uh, are people more likely to think about drivers in the daytime and other cars in the nighttime? Because in the daytime, you can actually like see the outline of the driver inside the vehicle. Yeah, I I was wondering about that as well. I I have to to think back on my most recent encounter with a driver that irritated me, which was, of course, this morning. Oh, okay. uh, Just just in uh, dealing with the parking deck. And the the car was driving in a way that I disapproved of. It was not (laughs) uh, not obeying the laws. Didn't meet your standards. No, I mean, my... I'm very much a rule follower. I believe you should you should when you're navigating, say, a car parking complex, you should you should not just drive willy nilly across uh, the parking places. You should follow the course. Yeah. And this this individual was not. Well, I mean, even if you're a rebel, you should be a rule follower in traffic situations because that prevents injuries. Right. Uh, but but in these cases, I often feel this um, this need to see the individual, mm-hmm. you know. And I I mean, on one hand, I, I guess I could excuse that and say, well, maybe I'm trying to do the, the appropriate thing and make a human contact with this person that has uh, irritated me. But then also, I'm kind of like, I just want to judge them more. I want to see what kind of person drives like this. And in this case, and in the daylight, the individual also had sunglasses on, so I wasn't able to really 
see, I wasn't able to make eye contact with them and see their eyes. Whoa. So there was still this something, you know, a, a layer between me and them. Uh-huh. And and certainly, I, drive, I mean, a sunny day, you drive with sunglasses. That's what I do. So of course. Uh, so I think we'd have to factor that in. But certainly at night, uh, you're going to have plenty of vehicles where you you certainly are not seeing any sense of the human inside them. And therefore, if you are inclined to view the, the vehicle as this metal beast, uh, you're, go, you're going to you know, have more license to do so. Oh, the second part of me wondering if people see cars more as cars in the nighttime is because the headlights are lit up. Oh, so yeah, it's that's like true. the eyes are glowing. Yeah. Now, I want to come back uh, at this point to just driving and the functionality of our brains. So, yes, it's intuitive enough that most of us become, quote unquote, experts. And uh, and yes, way too many of us multitask when we drive and, and usually do so without uh, anything terrible happening. Uh, you know, but we, and oftentimes we're engaging in downright dangerous activities. You know, people are still texting while driving or even if you're not doing things that, that are, you know, that are so explicitly uh, – uh, you know, uh, advised against or, or even, you know, there are even laws against, you'll still see people doing other kind of wacky things while driving, mm-hmm. like reading a book while driving a car <laughs> or, you know, putting on their makeup or, or eating eating food that is uh, inadvisable to eat while, while driving. Because it's one thing in my mind to have like a sandwich. But if you actually have to use, uh, you know, fork and knife, uh, then that's probably a meal you should stop the car for. I think it's probably just better not to eat while you're driving. <laughs> Pro- yeah, probably so. Uh, and you know, also, on the other hand, even without thinking of this, we a lot of us will drive, uh, maybe most of us will drive while some sort of audio is playing. Mm-hmm. You're going to listen to music or you're going to listen to the news or, you, or you're going to listen to a podcast. You may be listening to us right now as you drive. Uh, and even if you're just listening to like non-lyrical music, you are probably putting yourself into a state where you can you can daydream or, or you know or certainly think about uh, the day before or the day after. Uh, but we shouldn't assume that any of this means that driving a vehicle is cognitively simple. That we have just you know the c- excess cognitive space for all of our sandwich eating and makeup putting on activities. Not only is driving a cognitively demanding task, it's one of the more cognitively complex tasks that we engage in on a regular basis. Mm. Uh, this according to uh, uh, Cho et al. in Trajectories of Cognitive Decline by Driving Mobility, Evidence from the Health and Retirement Study. And this, is, uh, this was published in uh, ger- Geriatric uh, Psychiatry in 2013. And uh, they pointed out that there's, there's not only correlation between cognitive decline and driving cessation in old age, which of course can further limit social and physical fitness in an individual, but that, quote, it may also be the case that driving cessation itself is a risk factor for accelerated cognitive decline over time. This suggests that the relationship between driving cessation and cognitive functioning may be bidirectional. Yeah, that's interesting. So one direction, of course, is pretty clear there, right? It, driving cessation certainly correlates with declines in cognitive functioning. And the clear reason is that over time, you're less able to drive, so you stop doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the the authors think here it's also possible that driving cessation itself contributes to decline in cognitive functioning. Uh, but either way, the authors believe that older adults without independent driving mobility could be uh, viewed as a group who would benefit from, quote, targeted interventions that promote social, psychological, and cognitive engagement, which I think just means like giving them mentally stimulating things to do, which could help the brain stay healthy longer. Right. Now, on the other hand, I found at least one study that suggested perhaps long commutes could be a risk factor for declines in cognitive performance in older adults. Uh, This was in the American Journal of Epidemiology by uh, Bachrania et al., Uh, from 2017, and it's called Associations Between Sedentary Behaviors and Cognitive Function, Cross-Sectional and Perspective Findings from the UK Biobank. So this study looked at uh, an assessment of data from adults who had data stored in the UK Biobank. That's like a big research uh, tool that's got a bunch of data already ready to go in it. And it tracked performance on cognitive tests for UK adults across a mean period of 5.3 years. And then they cross-referenced any changes in mental performance performance over that time with lifestyle behaviors such as watching TV, driving, and non-occupational use of a computer. So using a computer but not for your job. 
And they, they found within their sample that increases in time spent driving and watching TV were both associated with decreases in cognitive performance over time, but computer use was not. Uh, in fact, computer use time was positively associated with cognitive performance. And this has been written up in some press outlets. I think it's generally interpreted as evidence that sedentary activities in general, including watching TV and driving, can lead to declines in cognition in time uh, over time in older adults. But at the same time, I think this is specifically about the sedentary activities. It's one where I saw some like press headlines, I think going over the top and interpreting it with Mm -hmm. lines like driving makes you stupid or the shocking threat to your mental health that you do every day. (laughs) Uh, I don't go overboard with interpreting this. This This is just one study not replicated yet as far as I'm aware. And it's not uniquely about driving. It's apparently multiple kinds of seated low movement activities. Yeah, it's easy to forget that that driving is a sedentary activity mm-hmm. because it can sure feel exhausting. Oh yeah. If you've you've done a long drive, you know, at the end of a of a lengthy drive, you may feel uh you know physically tired, uh emotionally, mentally drained. Uh and at, and yet at the same time, you have to realize that you barely moved for that uh, you know 4 hours or more of drive time. Yeah. Uh yeah, it is weird how exhausting it can be like that. Uh, But it does also make me wonder if these results are correct. It makes me wonder what's going on with the computer Mm -hmm. and like and also how does this square with other research? Uh, Because, uh, well, one thing before I get to that is do the cognitive effects of driving differ depending on what kind of driving you do and how much of it you do? That's one question because – I would certainly imagine that that say uh, driving on an open road or navigating tricky terrain is probably cognitively diff- different than just like sitting in traffic on a you know long congested commute. Well, perhaps, but then again, like a congested commute, you're still a lot of things you're paying attention to. I guess so. Yeah. Um, uh, well, anyway, so I want to get to the other thing. So back on the other hand, going against what we were just saying. I found another study that saw some noticeable differences in brain morphology between drivers and non-drivers, suggesting the possibility that driving sort of exercises specific parts of the brain leading to growth in brain tissue. For example, there's plenty of evidence that music training, like learning to play a new musical instrument, changes the structure of the auditory and motor cortices. It leads to, you know, more gray matter. Was is that funny? No, no. I'm just uh, I'm realizing that you're uh, you're about to talk to us about the knowledge. Oh, I love the knowledge. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there in a second. Uh, but yeah, so the the music thing that this is uh, an example of structural plasticity in the human brain. Does that extend to driving? Does driving perhaps also uh, stimulate the growth of more volume of gray matter in certain parts of the brain? Uh, apparently, at least at some level, at least according to the study we're about to look at. So this was published in 2017 in Nature Scientific Reports by Sakai et al. And uh, a quick note that this study, like a lot of studies about driving, was funded by uh, Toyota Central R&D Laboratories. Of course, there's you know the standard disclaimer that funders had no role in study design outcomes or decision to publish, but you should always be aware of potential conflicts of interest. And so the study began by the authors noting previous findings on the relationship between driving tasks and brain structure, including a 2000 study by McGuire et al. that found that London taxi drivers had more gray matter volume in the posterior hippocampus when compared to non-taxi drivers, and the amount of gray matter volume was correlated positively with how long they had been working as a taxi driver in London. And when they combined this with follow-up research, uh, this was interpreted as a sort of neuroplastic adaptation to the daily necessity of constant detailed spatial representations in the brain. So it seems like it wasn't just that London uh, London taxi drivers chose their job because they're naturally good at mentally representing spaces like mental maps of city streets, but that they got better at mentally representing spaces because they had to do it so much. And here's uh, obviously where you'd get into the idea of the knowledge. Uh, did Now, you were recently uh, in London. Yeah. Did you uh, get to ride in a cab and get to, to think about this? Yeah, uh, I think... I think I was seeing some uh, some smartphone navigation uh, when I was there recently, and that may I'm, be totally changing things. Yeah, I was, I'm wondering to what extent that would change things because I 
I went to London years ago. It must have been a decade or more, uh, maybe like 13 years ago. I went I went there. And, of course, at the time, uh, you didn't really see that kind of navigation taking place. And right. I, I distinctly remember riding in a taxi cab and kind of like staring at the taxi driver's skull and wondering if, if this was the knowledge, you know, <laughs> if, if I was looking at the, like the swelling of the knowledge in the brain. Well, we didn't actually explain it briefly, Robert. What The knowledge. What's the deal with the knowledge? The, the knowledge is that uh, in, in order to navigate the streets of London as a, as a cab driver, you have to you, you have to load it with all that information about uh, all these streets you're going to travel. Like you, you can't just you can't be busting out a map. You can't uh, depend on a, or at least you couldn't used to depend on Waze or Google Maps to to light the way for you. You had yeah. to have it inside. Uh, it reminded me a lot of um, geez, what what Mark Twain uh, story was it uh, where he's talking about about um, uh, navigating the Mississippi and just how well uh, trained one needed to be in every detail of the of the river. Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, you know I'm sure listeners will uh, will remind me. Uh-huh. Uh, but but it's that level of of, of detail like mm-hmm. you you would have to have. And so the idea is that that uh, you know assimilating all of that de- those details had a marked effect on the brain. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it appears that it does, and specifically exercising it over time, like facing your brain with these cognitive challenges day after day, appears to stimulate the growth of extra volume of, of tissue in certain parts of the brain that are that the brain depends on for these tasks mm-hmm. specifically. Uh, the authors also uh, point to research showing that professional auto racing drivers show greater gray matter volume in several brain regions when compared to non-experienced drivers. And I, I don't know specifically what types of tasks the uh, the gray matter in this uh, research is related to. But I, if I had to guess, I would say it's probably stuff like quick reflexes, peripheral vision perception, management of speed and that kind of stuff. And does that match up with your viewing of the Fast and the Furious movies? <laughs> I tell you, my viewing of the Fast and Furious movies has made my brain so powerful you <laughs> cannot comprehend. I have surpassed the limits of human imagination and creativity, and now most of my brain exists in another dimension full of cars and chains and sparks, and it's beautiful. <laughs> but anyway, so back to the study at hand. That, that was just all the stuff they begin, you know, by saying, Here, here's the research history. This study uh, in particular looked not at driving specialists like the, the cyborg navigators of London or the speed demon, uh, you know, racing drivers, but just regular old drivers. So are there any brain changes here between regular drivers and non-drivers, the authors believe they found evidence of it. They they collected brain images from 73 healthy young adults, 36 drivers, and 37 non-drivers, and they found, quote, compared with non-drivers, drivers showed significantly greater gray matter volume in the left cerebellar hemisphere, which has been associated with cognitive rather than motor functioning. That's interesting. So cognitive management of, uh, of information rather than just like controlling the body. Uh, and they say, in contrast, they found no brain areas with significantly greater gray matter volume in non-drivers when compared with drivers. So no, no evidence that being a non-driver also gives you any particular relevant boost. Uh, and the authors think that uh, the regions showing sp- specific growth for drivers versus non-drivers may be critical for driving a car but not frequently used during other daily activities. So there's that. But then also I think we should remember not to trust too much in the idea of like brain stimulation and plasticity as this kind of blanket panacea for the brain or, or, or total warding off of all cognitive decline because – While there is good evidence for adult neuroplasticity and some activities can increase specific cognitive competencies, I think there's also a lot of dispute still going on about many of the claims in this area. And one example I would give is the idea of so-called brain training games. Oh, yes. uh, Which, you know, they've been offered sort of as general prescriptions to improve cognitive performance and mental health. And the evidence that they can do that is highly disputed. Um, uh, like there were a group of studies and reviews since 2016 that have strongly questioned the claims of brain training game companies, uh, that, which promised general cognitive benefits from their gra- uh, games. One example was a study by Simons et al. in 2016 in psychological science in the public interest. It was just do brain training programs work? 
So they look at a bunch of different studies on the subject and they examine the strength of them individually. And they say overall, quote, based on this examination, we find extensive evidence that brain training interventions improve performance on the trained tasks, less evidence that such interventions improve performance on closely related tasks, and little evidence that training enhances performance on distantly related tasks or that training improves everyday cognitive performance. So it seems like the stuff that we have really good evidence for is that you get better at doing specifically whatever you're doing in the game. Mm. So if the, if the game is about, say, moving, you know, colored blocks around, you're going to yeah. get better at moving colored blocks around. And we should be cautious about taking that skill and then, uh, you know, overlaying it with other, you know, more important skills in life. Right. Sure. Uh, but this does make me think, I mean, that maybe you can, again, this is not fully known, but my, my guess at this point is that if you want to uh, prolong cognitive performance over life, it seems like maybe a good thing to do would be, of course, first focus on the forms of fitness that contribute to brain health overall, which is like getting good sleep, good diet and exercise mm -hmm. and all that. But beyond that, maybe to construct a kind of total ecology of mentally challenging and stimulating experiences, like a challenging and stimulating world rather than just a single type of task repeated. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it. You know, we all want you know the, the sort of simple trick, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the simple life hack. You know, you 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 want the the one pill that will uh, that will help your life and improve your your, your living, or you want that one exercise you can do mm -hmm. uh, that that one basically that one switch that you can pull that right. will change things. And uh, yeah, the, the reality is often well, I know it's multiple switches, yeah, uh, multiple things that you should uh, you should do, and maybe multiple things you should also curb or cut out. Yeah. Now, on the other hand, I, I want to say that I, I don't think it has been completely disproven that uh, doing certain types of tasks, like maybe certain puzzles or games or maybe driving or anything like that, could contribute to areas that are not specifically the task involved. I think it's just not proven yet. Okay. You know, so, you know, you, you could hold out that maybe there are sort of like distant relationship improvements that you could see within the brain. I just think the evidence isn't there. Now, another area of our of our experience with the automobile, our life with the automobile that uh, I wanted to talk about is the idea of car as symbol. Oh, yeah. And I think a lot of this should be pretty obvious. <laughs> uh, you know, automobile marketers, uh, you know, push this a lot. And it's kind of the, the, the real, I think the real meat that King and Carpenter were chewing on in Christine. Mm -hmm. The car becomes a symbol for a time, for a culture, for the individual. Even if you're not a car person... And, uh, you know, I'm not really a, a huge car person, but mm -hmm. but I even I admit, like if I'm watching a, a period piece, motion picture, yeah. or a television sh show, like the cars have to be right. And when you see that the cars are right, uh, it, it, you know, it really puts you in that time frame. And um, and uh, so, so the, you know, they become a symbol for a particular time, a particular culture, and then uh, very often a particular individual. Right. Uh, and then likewise, any car ad you see is going is, is often marketing to you uh, based uh, along these lines like drive this car be this person be this type of person mm -hmm. it's like the next jacket right the, the yeah. order of like identity definition and coolness it goes like jacket and then it goes car <laughs> I, I, was, I was reading something about all this uh it's titled uh, a primer on automobile semiotics by hefner et al and it was from the uc davis institute of transportation studies in 2006 and they point out that for starters, cars and trucks are often status symbols. It's, you know, it's obvious with luxury vehicles, but it also applies to various other categories. Uh, you know, basically it comes down, what does this vehicle say about who you are and where you fit in society? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's worth thinking about, with, you know, with your own vehicle, you know, whether you're driving, uh, you know, an electric vehicle, hybrid vehicle, uh, you know, an enormous, uh, you know, sports utility vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, you should at least, you know, entertain the question. And then as symbols, they can often – they can be used in the process of self-expression of individual identity as well as the self-creation of individual identity. However, the authors do note that you know, individuals are still going to you know, place differing emphasis on the symbolic power of the vehicle. Quote, thus the individual who claims his automobile is just a way to get around may be telling the truth. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I mean I think I'm in that camp. 
Yeah, not to disparage people who love their cars. I mean, I know a lot of people who get a lot of pleasure out of their their car experiences. Right, but then at the same time, like being the staying saying that you're not the type of person who cares about their car is still a statement about yourself and your identity and your values. Uh-huh. So you know, it's in a way, it's impossible to uh, to completely disengage from the semiotic uh, power of the car. Yeah. And then also I assume that, you know, that's ultimately where bumper stickers come into play, where you're like, the, right. car, is, the car has nothing to do with my self-expression. And I may say that, but then I still have like eight bumper stickers on my car that are, are there in part to, uh, uh, to communicate this to other people. But, but again, it's, it's difficult to, to really disengage from this entirely. And that's, that's something that the authors state too. They write, however, none of us can opt out of symbolic communication. We are surrounded by symbol systems and the goods we purchase are part of these systems. Therefore, our vehicles say something about us, whether or not we intend for them to serve as signifiers. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't want that to be the case for me, but I guess this is probably true. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's easy, I think, for us to also turn to the more, um, you know, obvious examples of this. You mm-hmm. know, we think about an individual driving a luxury vehicle or we think about, uh, you know, an individual driving a particularly outrageous vehicle. Like you, some of the, when you see somebody driving an art car mm-hmm. around town, something that looks like it should be a burning man. The Red Bull car. Yeah. Well, or, or a, yeah, a corporate vehicle. But I was thinking things like a, a car with a bunch of Barbie dolls stuck to it or coins attached to it or some sort of country western vehicle. You oh, know. I can get down with that oh there, there's a good car uh there's a good car that we sometimes drive past on the way back from work that's got a, oh, like a big wizard on the back of it it's a oh, van I've, I've seen that one as well yeah, yeah. it's a van with like a, a a psychic epic wizard holding a big world ball in his hand oh man i am a big uh, big fan of van murals yeah. uh, they're rare a rare sight these days but uh, uh that was an idea you know this is certainly a situation where for a while vans were big and you often had that big panel featureless panel on the side of the van right and that is a great place for self-expression. That was, the, that was where you put your wizard and your, 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 your various barbarian scenes right. and some sort of science, science fiction uh, scenario going down. This is Radagast the van. Yeah. <laughs> All right. On that note, we're going to take one more break. But when we come back, we are going to continue our look at, uh, at our cars and we're going to get to, into uh, the, the relationship that our cars have with our bodies and with our behavior. All right. We're back. Now, uh, you know, something we have we always have to consider when we think about the fusion between humans uh, and our tools are, you know, just to what do how is that communication taking place? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we want to use the machine, but we don't want to have to become more machine like to use it. Uh, we want the machine to become more accommodating to us. Uh, and part of that is intuitive design, but also uh, ergonomics is a big Im- Im- part of it as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you've ever climbed inside an older automobile, like I'm thinking something from the, you know, uh, the 60s or the perhaps uh, early 70s, uh, you can probably attest to the fact that they were, they were often less cockpit-like in their environment. And it was more like a small couch crammed inside of a vehicle body. You know? Oh, yeah. Well, the first car I ever drove was like a, it was a big old Cadillac that had bench seats. Yeah, big bench seats and then a, a dash that seemed like a mile wide, right? Uh-huh. Um <laughs> and uh, today, you're far more, more likely to find highly customizable seats, easily adjustable mirrors, and a fair amount, even I mean, an increasing amount of effort put into minimizing the stretching and reaching needed to drive the vehicle and adjust the, you know, the heating and air or the radio, the, the you know, the music or what, you know, whatever else you're going to be tinkering with. Uh, you know, so many different like hands-free options as mm-hmm. well. And all of this is about making the machine more accommodating to the human form and to the human body and human limitations without asking us to become more machine-like. Yeah, well, I th- yeah, it's aiding in that hybridization. Yeah. It's, you want to be a car centaur head. You know, th- this is the way. Like it sort of opens up the stump on the horse body for you to climb into, if that metaphor makes any sense. Yeah, yeah no, it, I think so. You know, now this isn't to say that the repetitive driving injuries are still not a thing. You know, you still see back pain, neck stiffness 
sickness, side ache, and eye strain. All of these are an issue. And you also see a strain associated with different, uh, you know, technological add-ons that end up coming. Like the main one that comes to my mind is when you have um, a laptop computer in a vehicle. You'll see this often with like service vehicles. So you'll see this with police officers. Oh, instance. right. Yeah, yeah. And like that adds a new level of rep- repeated movement inside of the car that the car may, you know, was probably not designed to accommodate. Right. So that can can open the door for potentially, you know, other strains, other bodily strains that can take place. But but car companies today, they, they even use tools like virtual reality to plan out an uh, ergonomic design well before they create a prototype to actually start sticking people inside of. Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. And so at this point, I want to come back, though, to, uh, to something we've touched on already a little bit. I want to come back to the, the human car hybrid and how the car may change how we actually behave. Because mm-hmm. we've talked about how it, it changes our perception, it changes, um, it changes how we, th- we think about other cars, other drivers, but then how does that actually factor into behavior itself? And I think we can all think of examples in our lives where we think and feel differently while driving. You were talking earlier about how much you enjoy driving, uh, you know, say out in the countryside. Yeah, you know, the I mountains. Think, yeah, yeah and we, I think that can feel very liberating. Even if you're not like a someone who would typically say, oh, I love driving, you may think to a time where you were, you know, cranking a favorite tune, uh, you know, you know, white, uh, winding through the mountains or whatever, mm-hmm. and you, you, you can look back at it and realize, well, that was very enjoyable. Enjoyable. I felt I felt alive. I felt free. I felt like some sort of a '70s rock song uh, incarnate, <laughs> right? Right. Or it makes you think about uh, the scenes in the movies where characters are, where always teenagers are driving down the road and all the windows are down and they're just going woo. <laughs> Have you ever driven down the road and just everybody gone woo? It doesn't happen in real life, even if yeah. you're having a good time. Yeah, I don't think I've gone woo. In Those a, are in artificial woos. necessarily. But but I certainly hear the the, the music side of it. Oh, totally. Yeah. Um, and, and some studies have shown that certain songs can make us drive faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can definitely I can definitely remember times where I was driving too fast, and it was it was it was all uh, Led Zeppelin's fault. <laughs> Specifically, immigrant song, immigrant song. <laughs> yeah, not a good uh, not a good slow driving song. Uh, another area that I think to when I think of. Um, of behavior while driving is this that weird sense of herd mentality that can take hold on highways mm-hmm. um, where we you know we, we gauge the appropriate speed what is the what is the pack doing and then we also have to deal with the stalking predator like highway patrol cars uh, <laughs> that are out there as well uh, I always every time I drive I, I think about that how I'm I feel like I am putting myself in the mindset of a fish and I'm and I have to think about uh, the sharks that are out there uh, and, uh, and and so I think about that like every time I let a really fast driver, uh, you know, go go by me. You right. Know, I'll get out of the way. Let them go. Let them attract the sharks. You stay with the school. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stay back here with the school uh, and I'm going to follow the school rules. Well, I'm sure that traffic patterns show the same kinds of uh, uh, emergent behaviors from the group individual motions that you would see in the flocking of birds or the movement of schools of fish. Yeah. Despite however much it might seem to the contrary, I think there is often kind of a, an emergent intelligence that comes out of a group of cars, like, say, trying to get around an obstruction in the road or something. Yeah. And then also in, in nature, we see, of course, the uh, the way that uh, that a species will communicate uh, to other members of their species uh, that there are predators in their vicinity. Mm-hmm. And then also we see uh, interspecies communication about this as well. Um, and what do we see out on on, on our highways? Uh, used to, if there was if there was a you know a, a traffic stop up ahead or a speed trap, if someone might you know flash their lights at you. <laughs> now we have more robust that. technological means of doing this through programs like Waze. Oh yeah, where you see you see a police vehicle, you you tag them. And I, and I certainly don't mean to disparage police officers or you know highway patrolmen or anything like that. It's like cutting down on speeding is actually a public good. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, but but I mean that when we uh, when I view them, I can't help. And part of this is seeing the car and not thinking about the person, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or in fact, seeing the uniform and not thinking about the person. You just see them as a potential threat on some level. Like right. this is a person that could that I could get I could get in trouble. They well, could give me a speeding ticket. And if you're driving on a highway, you probably are technically speeding. <laughs> if, you're keep, <laughs> if you're if you're again, just keeping up with the pack. Right. Yeah. I mean, that is often the case on our freeways. But yeah, I mean, when people are trying to get somewhere, they're not usually thinking about the public good. They're just thinking about, you know, the they're kind of in self mode and they're like, I got to get there. Right. But then there's another area of behavior that uh, that obviously comes up and that's road rage. Mm-hmm. 
I've, I've read a little bit of, about this before, and I was uh, looking over uh, the information again. Uh, there was a 2010 paper that I rather liked uh, titled Road Rage, What's Driving It? Oh, by, the puns. Yes, <laughs> by Randy and Lori uh, Sansone. And uh, they, they have a nice compact definition of road rage uh, because the definition of road rage becomes important when you're you're teasing it apart. They say road rage may be described as a constellation of thoughts, emotions, and behaviors that occur in response to a perceived unjustified provocation while driving. Road rage may also be defined as those driving behaviors that endanger or potentially endanger others that uh, and are accompanied by uh, intentional acts of aggression towards others, negative emotions while driving, and risk taking. So again, I think it's important to think of it again as a constellation of thoughts and emotions because mm -hmm. road rage as it is often or it, certainly for a while, uh, the, the way it was utilized in, uh, in the media, well, it, was all, it almost had this supernatural context. It was almost like lycanthropy, you know, <laughs> right. like someone was overcome by road rage, like the machine leached into your body and turned you into a monster yeah. uh, as if there is one single cause or even one single, uh, you know, uh, uh, symptom of, of, of this thing we're talking about. Well, I feel like it was also used in sort of like shifting contexts where it originally emerged. Didn't it originally emerge with reference to like really violent acts like shootings in, in L.A. due to traffic where people got really angry and did violent outbursts? But then it would also just be used to refer to people like getting mad and giving rude gestures and stuff. Yeah, yeah. The phrase itself was coined in the late 1980s by newscasters at KTLA in Los Angeles following a series of freeway shootings. Yeah. Um, but it was. Uh, it wasn't until 1994 that it was really picked up uh, by you know by various headline stealing scare stories. Yeah. But uh, one of the – again, it, it is often used to encompass a number of behaviors, but the most classic is, is people becoming angry due to being cut off in traffic. Right. Uh, you hear about this all the time. They, they take this as a, def, as a direct affront to their, uh, their identity, to their person, to their goals. And then, but what is essentially happening in the brain? Well, first, the, the stress hormone cortisol rushes uh, through your bloodstream and ups your blood pressure. Next, adrenaline kicks in, kicks in to heighten your aggression. And that's the thing, too. You know, essentially, you go into a, a, a fight or flight scenario, but you, you can't really – fly away. You can't really run away due to the, the flow of traffic. Uh, uh, so it's been argued that you tend to go towards more of the fight mindset, uh, thus the aggression. Um, and then also, um, you know, your, your uh, serotonin is dropping, dopamine is increasing. So your emotional intelligence is decreasing and your body is, is posed for some sort of altercation to take place. Okay. But of course, your body is also in a car and your aggressor's body, the aggressor's body is in a car. And, uh, and uh, this also, you know, contributes to this weird scenario that you're in. So according to the, the authors, if you just ask around, uh, up to one third of the population has perpetrated something that they think of as road rage or could be defined as road rage. Now, uh, again, to dissociate from the original context, this wouldn't necessarily mean any kind of violence. Right. Uh, meanwhile, only 2 percent or less of incidents actually result in serious vehicle damage or personal harm. And then also when it comes down to who are the actual primary perpetrators of road rage, mm -hmm. it tends to be young males. That's not super surprising. And, uh, and they point out that there, you know, obviously there are psychological factors that come into play here uh, that contribute to a general tendency to displace anger and blame others. And this is pre-existing. This is not caused by, uh, you know, automobile-induced cognition, though I think you can make a lot of cases for if, if you have underlying psychological factors or certainly if there's a bona fide psychiatric disorder, um, especially drug or alcohol addiction, anxiety, depression, antisocial personality disorders, all of these things could potentially be aggravated by uh, automobile cognition. But then also, you know, there are plenty of, uh, of, of people that have argued against just the idea of road rage in general, saying that this is essentially, uh, you know, an out-of-control headline situation. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I mean, is road rage actually a, a unique driving-related phenomenon, or is it just instances of people getting angry and acting mean, as would happen in any other context, but here it happens in cars. Yeah. Uh, for instance, there was a 1998 article in The Atlantic titled Road Rage Versus Reality by uh, Michael Fomento. And, uh, and he argued against studies and polls that were supporting the notion of road rage. He argued that road rage was uh, you know, an excessively broad term that applied to a variety of violent situations while also allowing us to ignore behaviors that actually caused accidents, such as drivers running red lights. Uh -huh. 
and the, you know, ultimately, it's just a more sensational thing uh, to, to uh, for your headline, for your explanation of events, and also for sort of judging other people too as you're out driving, right? Right. Uh, it's easier to just say, "Oh, that person's uh, just road raging back there," uh, and then you can just sort of dismiss uh, you know, any you know further or deeper consideration of you know what their day is like. Right. But but when you you look at some of these studies and these uh, uh, these different um, surveys about road rage behavior, it, it is really interesting. I was looking at a 2016 study by AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, uh, and they found that 80% of drivers expressed uh, sufficient anger, aggression, or road rage behind the wheel, at least in the past year. And so, yeah, some of these stats are crazy. So, for, ex- for example, uh, purposefully tailgating. So oh, I that, hate would, that, one. that would be driving way too close to the car in front of you perhaps trying to signal to them that they should move into another lane and let you go past. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I hate that one when you're – maybe you're on a two-lane highway, one lane going each way and, right. you know, and somebody is just right up on you. I think they want you to go faster. Right. And it's it's a dangerous situation. Cars are not supposed to be that close to each other right. uh, because that can end and uh, it can cause the cars to crash together. Um <laughs> and and yet, uh, yes, yeah, so you often see it, especially in that scenario where somebody wants the car to get over into another lane and let them pass, mm-hmm. um, almost using it as a kind of like aggressive communication system. It makes one wonder if there was like a, a better – if there was a specific light one could use for that. Maybe that would be a safer scenario. But in terms of statistics, uh, 51 percent. So the idea would be 104 million drivers. Uh, are doing this. Or uh, there's another one that's perhaps more relatable, yelling at other drivers, 47% or 95 million drivers. Now, does that include yelling so that they can hear you or just yelling within your own vehicle? I think it's about yelling within your own vehicle uh, because that's another aspect of all of this and uh, often kind of a critique of road rage is that we feel enclosed. We feel at least Uh semi-masked. There is a you know, certainly other people can see us, but they can't hear us. So I can say anything I want, and you don't know. Maybe I'm just I'm just singing. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm at a, a conference call. I'm not calling you a bunch of dirty names, honking to show annoyance or anger. Obviously, that's a big one. Uh, at times, it feels like that we have a culture have decided that that is what the horn is for, mm-hmm. uh, and not for alerting other people to our pe- to our our, um, our our presence. Uh, on the other hand, I feel like – so I don't honk to show people anger, but sometimes I forget the horn is there. Uh-huh. And there are cases where I'm like, wow, I should have honked to like get somebody's attention, but I just like forgot that my car could do that. <laughs> I also feel like sometimes there's a cultural difference because if you, tr- you travel to other parts of the world uh-huh. and – and you encounter cultures where honking is, say, something you do every time you go around a corner on a, like a one-way road because uh-huh. it's essential to communicate to other cars that you are there. Or honking is more of a, a way of communicating, of, of saying hi to people. You know, uh, I guess you still have that, that here. But I, I don't know. I feel like I, I feel bad if I honk at somebody like who is just walking on the sidewalk. It feels a little bit uh, intrusive. Oh, you mean to say hi. Not like they need to get off the sidewalk so you can drive on. Right, right, exactly. Uh, but some of these other um, uh, activities that we're looking at, like making angry gestures, 33% or 67 million drivers. Wow. Trying to block another vehicle from changing lanes, 24% or 49 million drivers. What? Don't do that, folks. Yeah, like I say, that that fish wants to be eaten by a shark. Uh-huh. Let that fish go forward. Let that fish find the shark. That's the way I always look at it. Uh uh, cutting off another vehicle on purpose, 12%, 24 million drivers. Getting out of the vehicle to confront another driver. Oh, no. That one's thankfully down at 4%, 7.6 million drivers. How often does that lead to something good? Yeah, n- never. At the very least, it's going to lead, to, uh, I would assume, to embarrassment when you realize I just got out of my car to yell at somebody and now I should get back in because I look – at at best, like an idiot, and at worst, like a like a violent aggressor mm-hmm. uh, who you know who should the authority should be called on, and then finally bumping or ramming another vehicle on purpose three percent five point seven million drivers. Wow. So wait, then where do you come down? Do you, do you think is road rage just like one particular context of normal types of interpersonal rage, or is it a specific and unique thing? I t- I tend to follow the idea here that I mean we're dealing. You can't say that we come and com- become a completely different person when we drive. Mm-hmm. But I feel like uh, the data shows that 
driving changes the way we interact with the world and how it changes the way we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that is going to lend its way to an altered sort of behavior. Mm -hmm. So you might not be the type of person who would ever shoot the middle finger to another person, say, uh, you know, in a grocery store. Right. But on the way to the grocery store, perhaps you would. Mm -hmm. You might not never you might never yell something ugly at someone on the street. But in the car, it makes sense because perhaps they can't hear you. Well, this is another way that, again, it changes our perception of space. I mean, I was thinking about would I ever yell at a person? Would I ever like roll down a window in the car and yell at somebody? No. But would I like (laughs) yell within my own car about something that somebody else did? Yeah, I've done that. And it makes me think like, well, yelling within within my own car is almost like having a thought inside my head. Ah. You know, so it's like the the car's interior space, uh, the enclosure aspect of that has almost come to be like like what happens in there doesn't happen to the outside world unless you, you know, really attempt to show it to the outside world. Like, you know, it's a private space. You tend to su- to assume people are not looking in your car actively at you. Uh, so, yeah, I, I almost feel like, well, I can just like yell like, oh, why'd you, do-? you know, I, I can yell at somebody who did something stupid on the road in my car. They're not going to hear it. And it's almost like it didn't even happen out loud. Yeah. Uh, so road rage, I think, is one of the more studied and written about and comment- commentated on, you know, aspects of the scenario. But there are there are other activities that I think are also illuminating, like, for instance, if you're already asking yourself, like, do I yell in my car and is it okay? And would I yell if I were outside my car? Another example that is often brought up is picking one's nose. Okay. So you yeah. might not be the type of person to to do a lot of like nose related self, uh, you know, hygiene and personal care while you were say standing in line at the grocery store or wherever. But when you're in the car, you might very well do so. And you, yeah. you probably see, you see people do this all the time. And I think a lot of that has to do with this, this idea that when you're in the car, you are masked, you are you know, secluded from everyone else. But of course, you're not really. People right. can see you picking your nose or they can, they can see you doing you know, whatever it is you're doing. Another uh, activity that comes to mind is staring at people. Mm-hmm. Like there's a certain amount of like, you know, we all have to observe people and sights in our vicinity. But when we're driving a car, I wonder if we're more inclined to stare at particularly pedestrians. Mm. You know, we're we're more inclined to, you know, to 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 gaze at them longer than would be socially acceptable if we were out on the sidewalk with them. Right. Again, because you feel maybe like you are invisible. You're behind a barrier. You're in a deer blind almost. Yeah. It's like you know you can see them, but they can't see you. Yeah. So uh, you know, th- those are just a couple of I think uh, of ideas where we might see uh, cognition within the car. Uh, it being a slightly different thing than cognition on the sidewalk. Yeah, uh, I buy that. Yeah, and perhaps there are some other uh, examples that come to mind uh, out there among our listeners. <laughs> I know we have a lot of listeners who who drive cars. A lot of them may be driving a car right now. And uh, you know, I would also love to hear about hear from people in different cultures. You know, what is what is it like? Uh, you know, driving, uh, say, in the United States versus driving in, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, India or or even the UK or, you know, any any, any part of the world. Uh, I'm interested about the, the difference not only in driving culture, but sort of what our cognition might be like in those different environments. Well, having recently driven on the roads in the UK, where, of course, the lanes are reversed, you know, mm-hmm. driving on the left side of the road, I remember wondering if there's any kind of uh, brain hemisphere, eye and oh. hand dominance weirdness going on that's like uh, reversed uh, uh, when you're driving on different sides of the road. Interesting. I did adapt to driving on the left, but it also – it felt different in a way that didn't – that wasn't just unfamiliarity. It felt different in a way that it, it was like it was inherently different. Hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, no, no. I think I get what you, you're talking about. I've, I've never uh, driven uh, on, on reversed lanes like that before. Um, I've just ridden in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even that can be – I almost, I think I almost died at one point in Jamaica, uh, be, not because I was driving a car, but I got out of a car mm. and kind of had this sort of background notion of which way traffic travels. And so I like just sort of stepped out into, into the road and uh-huh. luckily nobody was there to run me over. Uh, but, uh, you know, little things like that, uh, you know, certainly can play a, you know, be a big factor uh, when the lanes are reversed. Yeah. So anyway, we'd love to hear from anyone out there who has thoughts about about their relationship with their cars, how the car and how the car changes the way you think or behave or even its effects on your physical body. 
Uh, in the meantime, if you want to check out other episodes of Stuff to Blow Your Mind, head on over to StuffToBlowYourMind.com. That's where you will find them. And as always, the best way to support our show is to make sure you have subscribed and to rate and review wherever you have the power to do so. And if you're into this whole question of, uh, you know, how does technology change how we behave and how we think about ourselves, you should definitely check out our other podcast, Invention. Oh, yeah. Because Invention is a journey through human techno history. Like, each episode is ine- inevitably going to get into questions of, how did this invention, how did this technology change the way we interact with reality and with ourselves? Totally. If you're not subscribed to Invention yet, get on over there. Subscribe to Invention. Uh, Huge thanks, as always, to our excellent audio producer, Seth Nicholas Johnson. If you would like to get in touch with us with feedback on this episode or any other, to suggest a topic for the future, just to say hi, you can email us at contact at stufftoblowyourmind.com. Blow Your Mind is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.